Wow, it's so great to see everybody here. Um, the first thing I want, the first group of people that I'd like to welcome and thank today are the students and their teachers and a few of the chaperones here too. We had over 15,000 students compete in the National Personal Finance Challenge this year, and you are the ones that made it here. I just spoke to one of the seniors who graduated yesterday and one who is graduating tomorrow. So we're sorry we messed up the party for one, but not for the other. But I'd like to ask, ask all, all the graduating, graduating seniors, seniors to stand so that we can recognize them. Whoa! And it just shows your dedication for at the very end, even after school in some of your cases, you are here today to compete and it will serve you well. I, uh, I was at my college reunion this weekend, which is why I missed last night, and I was chatting with somebody about, you know, people were catching up on what they were doing. And she said, you know, I've, I've, done, I've done okay. And uh, she's had a big career in philanthropy, working for a financier, who's a very famous philanthropist. And she said, but boy, if I'd had some of this in high school, I think I would have made some better decisions along the way. And I said, well, that's good to hear, because I'm going to tell that <laughs> to this group that I'm speaking to tomorrow, so they understand um, how important this is, but also how fortunate that you all are to, uh, to participate and to have this knowledge to bring with you going forward. Um, I hope you've had a great experience working with your teams over the year uh, to, to get here and that you're enjoying the experience of being here. Uh, I know it's great to be with your, your, your friends, uh, especially not, not in school and to hang out a little bit, but I really encourage you to meet some of the other students here. They're all really wonderful and, and it's just such a nice opportunity to meet people who are doing things that are maybe a little different than you other than the personal finance challenge. Um, you will now have I think an abundance of options as you go forward, whether you choose a career in finance, technology, or arts. I spoke to somebody who's going to music school next year, uh, but this will serve you well no matter what. I also want to thank two very important organizations, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland and VOIA, who have both been stalwart champions of our work and this challenge in particular. Voya, if you haven't figured out from talking to the myriad of volunteers that they have with the, have here today, um, they they do every day what you've been doing, but they do it for almost 15 million people. Uh, their support of this program has just been amazing, and we'll say more about some of the specific people in, uh, in a little while. But I think the thing that Voya does that's so special is that they really bring not just the financial knowledge but the confidence to all Americans. Uh, so that they can plan for their future, uh, for themselves, their families, and their communities, and quite frankly, the overall economy. That last part of, our, of the mission of us and of this challenge, the economy, kind of what the Federal Reserve is all about, and here we are today uh, in Cleveland, just one of its branches, and we are so grateful to uh, not only well, to everybody at the, in the, at the Cleveland Fed. Loretta Mester, their CEO, um, and the whole team here who's done so much. Uh, as you know, the Federal Reserve's uh, job is to maintain the stability of our financial system, um, and they are working very hard these days to do that. Uh, to meet that objective, uh, we need leaders throughout our economy who can continue to be guardians of their own institutions um, and, and of the, the public, public trust. trust. Uh, one of those, is certainly our speaker today, President Loretta Mester. Uh, she runs the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. She's also, I'm proud to say, a board member of the Council for Economic Education. She's had many successes and achievements. You can read all about those in your program. But I like this, this quote from one of her colleagues. Loretta expresses herself clearly and isn't afraid to make her views known, which she did last week, even when they go against the received wisdom but she's always open to data and studies that might change her mind. The American people need that kind of perspective and context, as well as the strength and determination that leaders such as Loretta provide. It is a pleasure for me to turn this over to Loretta to hear her remarks. Well, 
Thanks very much, Nan, for that. That was very, very good opening of the challenge today. This is, uh, you know, a really great day for the Cleveland Fed, and I'm really happy to invite everyone here um, who's watching online or in the room, which is exciting, um, to the finals of the National Personal Finance Challenge. So. I also want to, you know, let people know we have a watch party going on down on the first floor where local high school students have, have been able to come in to watch the event. So um, great, great to have them here as well. And I really want to congratulate all the students and their teachers for making it here to the finals. It was a significant amount of work that you went through, um, and I really appreciate your your coming to Cleveland. So. Thank the judges in advance for all the things that you've been able to do. Um, you have your work cut out for you. Um, it's going to be a great, great day here, and I'm really looking forward to, to the fun we're going to have over the next couple of hours. So the National Personal Challenge, uh, Challenge also has really deep roots. Um, if you wanted to, you could trace it all the way back to 1597. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty long, long event. But that was when Francis Bacon coined the phrase, knowledge itself is power. And of course, he wasn't talking about personal finance, but he was exactly right in that if, if, if you have an understanding of financial, um, you really have power over your life. Um, you know how to buy a house. You know how to you know, save. You know how to invest. Um, you know how to build up a credit score. You know how to build up work, your, your net worth. You know how to leave net worth to others in your family. You know how to avoid bad investment decisions, and you know how to make good ones. And that power, right, gives you control over your life. You also know how to lower stress, right? We know that from studies after studies that money issues are really a, a, a primary source of stress in people's lives. So having this knowledge, understanding the financial landscape can be really important of de-stressing your life. It gives you confidence in, I mean, moving forward. And you know, the financial system is changing a lot. There are new products, there are new service providers, and that can be very stressful in and of, of itself. It's sort of like keeping up with that. Having personal finance knowledge in education, it can really make you able to navigate that changing landscape. And it gives you a lot of opportunities. So I always like to say that, you know, you'll be able to open a business if you want to. You'll be able to help a foundation further its important work. You'll be able to really help others learn what you've learned. And so you create your own opportunities if you understand more about finance. So it's a fun, it's a really foundational element for a stronger economy. The economy itself is stronger if it's more inclusive and understanding and understanding how to interact with the financial system gives you a stronger economy because you can then partake of it. So we're happy to have you here. The Cleveland Fed has been very dedicated to work um, over, over many years to try to further the work of education in both economics and finance. Um, we have a, a program here that I think is, is quite good that we sponsor called the Annie Dollar Academy. There are other opportunities if you go to our website to learn some of the things that we're doing in terms of lesson planning for teachers. And I think you know it really shows that we are dedicated to doing this because it makes for a stronger economy. So I really appreciate everyone being here. I'm really excited about being able to host um, and seeing the competition going forward. And, you know, so this is it, students and teachers, you know, you've all worked really hard to get to the finals, really hard to get to the Cleveland Fed. And remember, knowledge itself is power. So now we're going to see which team is the most powerful team today. So thanks for being here. So before I announce the teams, I'm going to make you wait just a couple more moments. I'm going to introduce our esteemed judges for today. Uh, and I'm going to go from your right to left. Uh, so first is Heather Lavalley, the Chief Executive Officer of Voya Financial. Uh, then we have Dr. Julie Heath, Executive Director and Alpa Professor of, the, of Economics at the University of Cincinnati. 
recently retired, uh, but still a stalwart supporter of the challenge for which we are very grateful, and also a CE board member representing our national affiliates, people like Jennifer Davidson, who you has been just masterful at helping things to happen here. Uh, T.D. Cole, Chief Executive Officer of Legacy Franchises at City, um, and I'm so glad that we were able to ask her to join us today as well. And at the very end, <laughs> Dr. Ruben Rivera, who's our Senior Director of Academic Programs at CE, and he's gonna be keeping time. Uh, and now, I've got the final four teams. I just need to say, and I know you competitors have heard this before, but I heard a bunch of presentations today. This was, there are a lot of really good presentations. So um, for the juniors, we expect to see you all back here next year. But here are the final four, as they say. Team number 17 from Vestavia Hills. You can stand up. There you go. Team number 26, Arkansas School for Math, Science, and Tech. Yes, it is okay to be excited. <laughs> Team number 31, Adrian Wilcox. And last but not least, team number 20, Andover. <laughs> All right, so room number one is team 17, Vestavia. Room number two, team 26, Arkansas. Room number three, team 31, Adrian Wilcox. And room number four, uh, is team 20 and somebody smarter than I am is going to tell you exactly what to do. So team 17, you're on deck. Come up, welcome, come on up, and you're going to present right away. And then the other three, please come with me. So once again, team 17, Vestivia Hills will be our first presenting team. The, the, the remaining teams, Team 26, Arkansas School for Math, Science, and Arts, Team 31, Adrian Wilcox, and Team 20 from Andover. Could you please go to the earlier presentation rooms to await your big moment? But right now, we're going to ask Vestivia Hills to come up. And from, uh, from Alabama, we've got uh, Zane Farokwai, Jonathan Wu, and Edward Pang. Show us your stuff. They will have 10 minutes to present their solutions for a case study that were presented earlier today. They've had two hours to prepare, plan, and create presentations for a fictitious family and their financial needs. And then after their 10 minutes of presenting, there will be five minutes allotted for questions from our judges. So everybody, please welcome to the stage our first finalist from the state of Alabama, the Stevie Hills High School. Hi, te Hi teams. Yes. Uh, Microphone should be ready to go. Testing, there testing. There you go, okay. Cool. Welcome, right. I will be your timekeeper and you're gonna have 10 minutes to present. At nine minutes, I will give you a one minute warning. Then after that, at 10 minutes, I will ask you all to stop. Then the judges will be asking you questions for five minutes. Then after that, at four minutes, I will give you a one minute warning, okay? All right, with that being said, are we ready to go? Absolutely. All right, let's get this show on the road. I think we may begin. All right, welcome to EZJ Financials. I'm Eddie Pang. I am Zane Faruqi. And I'm Jonathan Wu. All right, so let's get us started. First is our case study. It's the Wallace family. You've probably heard it a couple times, but I'll recap it for you. Steve is a master electrician. He makes 80K per year. Emily is a paralegal. She makes 64K per year. They have three under their care. John, who's currently retired. Olivia, who aspires to attend the Chicago Institute of Art, and Andrew, who's finishing a gap year. Before we begin, I'll walk you through the advising process. What separates us from the other four teams? The main thing is we have goals, and then we identify the current state. So how can we adapt to the family's goals? What do they want to achieve? And then from there, we can make suggestions and ultimately advise them to go on the right path. So then we'll set up priorities, short-term priorities, long-term priorities. What does the family need to strive to, to actually execute? And then eventually we'll evaluate the process, making sure they're following the right path throughout their entire financial journey. Family goals, let's start with that. Well, I've summed it up into four main things. The first is retirement. The second is their hobbies and interests. The third is to support the other family members. And ultimately, the fourth is mortgage. Pretty simple goals, but we'll see the complexities behind it. 
Now is the current state, which we'll walk through. The first is assets. All right. So the first thing to look at is that we see they have a wide variety of accounts and assets. We see they have their 529 plan. We see they have multiple banking accounts. They have a house, vehicles. And then let's look at their income. We see that their net income combined together is 144K. And then after taxes, it's 103K. And also, we see that on average, every year, they get about 3K per year for their tax refund. And moving on to their important liabilities, we have we mainly categorize them into four sections. First, we have their house and mortgage, which they have to pay around 24000 a year at a 5.5% interest. And also, both Steve and Emily have credit cards, which they have a balance, and they need to pay that off later. And they also have a Subaru, which also has a balance, which, need, which they need to pay off in the future. And then moving on to expenses, um, their all the other main expenses include their house and their credit card and also their car and car insurance and for John's social security supplement. And this ranges from 40, uh, 4,800 to 7,200 because um, originally they were only paying around like 200, but they're planning on increasing it to um, $700. So the range will, um, there's a range between that. And so the total value between all this could range from 42000 to $45,000. Okay, so the children's future, the education. Obviously, we don't have a concrete number, but that's the beauty of it, because then we can make adaptations. But for right now, we know that Andrew is ready to begin post-secondary education. He lives at home currently, but his family wants him to expand outwards. Olivia is currently 10 years old. She wants to attend the Chicago Art Institute, but obviously, things have changed. My goal originally was not to go to finance, so we say that Olivia might not direct towards art, but regardless, she has the trust fund of month for whatever she decides to pursue. So the ideal budget. So this ideal budget is what we organize as what the family should be spending in each of these separate categories. And from what we found that um, the categories that were given in our case study, the, the amount of money that they were spending in these categories, which included like house, mortgage, insurance, this added up to $42,000. And what from our ideal budget, they should be spending $77,514. So we found that there's a difference between of, of that of 34700 So they're misusing these um, this extra cash, which could be helping them resolve their debt and um, uh, overcoming their future goals and supporting their children along the way. All right, we've walked you through the current state, and now we're going to discuss the priorities. So we have an ideal budget, and now we're going to present to you what the family needs to do, divided into two terms. First is short term. The second is long term. How we're going to develop priorities, how we're going to analyze the different decisions to make, these are all what this team will ultimately decide. So we're going to have a current step, a long term step, and ultimately, we can step into the future and actually achieve our goals. So the first step for short-term priorities is we want to pay off bad debt. So anything which has like a really high APR rate, for instance, it could be credit card debt or your car loan, we recognize that mortgages do have a high interest rate, but we feel like it's irresponsible for this family to spend like 100K plus in a year, and they can't even do it with their current budget. So that's why we're going to slowly pay off that house in the future, but we'll increase the monthly contributions. But then what we want to do is they have this 3K tax refund every year, they can use that to cover the credit card debt, and then they can also pay down their car with the extra cash they have from the balance restructuring or for their um, budget. Then the next thing that they need to do is have these plans. So for instance, they do not have an emergency fund, so we suggest creating one, which can last for about six months, given that let's say one of the parents in the situation lose one of their jobs, they're able to sustain themselves for at least six months and continue living their lifestyle. Also, we noticed that for Emily, at least, she did not spend that much or contribute that much to her retirement. So we, we suggest starting a retirement account as soon as possible, such as like a Roth IRA, and continuing to contribute to her 401k. With the Roth IRA, we realized that upfront, if you're paying the taxes, in the future, we believe that tax rates are gonna go up in the future. Right now, they're historically low. So if you pay for it right now, then in the future, you're gonna see a lot of tax savings in the future. And moving on to insurance, currently the families, uh, their life insurance only covers around $300,000. So if something were to happen, they would only be able to just cover their house and that would be it. And all their other expenses wouldn't be covered. So this is why we suggest them moving into a term life insurance because this is the best option and the price point is um, best for them. And also for their healthcare insurance, we believe that their healthcare is, um, it, 
it's well, it's good right now, and it's it covers enough things for their family. Here's a justification between why we want to prioritize John's support before we consider Andrew and Olivia. The thing is, John relies on these parents' paychecks. He relies ultimately around 700 a month, and justification for doing Andrew second is the fact that he's taking a gap year and he's about to go into post-secondary education. So we'll have another slide discussing Andrew. The main thing that we want him to consider is financial aid. But again, we also want to look at in-state tuition in state schools because he's unsure about his future. He's not entirely sure. So we suggest maybe look towards a state school, alleviate some of the financial burden. Also, we would say you want to invest in the 529. They currently have 5,700, but we want to say you want to go to the 10K limit under the SECURE Act. So, long-term priorities. We've discussed short-term. There's four overarching things long-term-wise. Car insurance, Olivia's support, retirement, and ultimately, how can they achieve their hobbies? So the first thing we realize is that for the cars they currently have, the premiums that they're paying might be like way too high. So they do have low deductibles, but we suggest that compared to the valuations of these cars, that they find a different plan with a lower premium, but a higher deductible so we can achieve the right risk to reward ratio. And secondly, the dad wants to replace the Ford, so we suggest trading it in down the road before it appreciates. So for retirement, so first off, the way we calculate the retirement savings is by multiplying the wage of each of the people in the family by 13. And then what we did is we realized that 37% of their income will be covered by Social Security if they withdraw at age 67. And then for Steve particularly, 50% of his income is being replaced by his pension. So that means that only 13% is left that needs to be covered, and his 401k has more than enough money to cover that. The only other thing is that the family needs to switch healthcare plans except for Steve once he retires. And then for Emily, she can retire also. At, she can retire at 65. She needs 832k for like a comfortable retirement. The 401k covers 102k. Social Security covers 270k. So with the annuity calculator, we figured out that if she invests into a Roth IRA and contributes 1,200 per month for about 19 years, then they'll cover the 460k left, which covers everything. So Olivia's education, again, she has a lot of time left, but we would say the main thing is a consistent five to nine. The case study says that it's been inconsistent, so we advise them to consider investing into the five to nine, and after that, look for financial aid and other forms of scholarships. And then One the minute hobbies. remaining. So now we're gonna finish this off with their hobbies and their wants. So specifically for Steve, he has a hobby for woodworking and he needs around $8,000. We believe that this, um, this hobby is ideal and it's realistic in the future. So if he slowly um, invests money over time, he will easily be able to uh, uh, materialize his hobby. And in addition to that, uh, he also could use this woodworking hobby as a side hustle and he could earn more money. So instead of just incurring a loss, he could make something out of this and just have more fun with it. Cool. So we've given you the steps, but now it's up to the family and how they balance their wants and their needs. And ultimately, we've, through the evaluation process, will help them along the way, ensuring that they allocate their money not only in the first month, but also in the first year and in the next decade. That is the goal of this firm. And through this process, through this list of priorities and what we believe is correct, we believe that we can help them achieve a balanced lifestyle and the right financial path. Time is up. Teams, please stop presenting. Judges, thank you. Round of applause. All right, judges, you now have five minutes to ask any follow-up questions, and time starts now. Thank you very much. That was very, very good. Thank you for judging. Very impressive. So I, I want to talk a bit about the medium term. So you suggested that uh, the income tax rebate that they're getting go off, uh, go toward paying off their car. That's a 4,000, so just take a couple years of, and then that's done. Um, as much as we may not like to discuss it, John's care will end at some point. What should they do with the funds that are freed up um, both from the paying off of the Subaru and when John no longer needs financial assistance. Where should those monies go? So first off, we had cleared out the 32K from like the, the budget restructuring. So what we could say is that since John's like thing is super crucial, 
they, if they can, they can put that tax rebate, like for instance, after they pay off the credit card debt, the super high APR rate, and they pay off the Subaru, they can do that. And if they want to uh, care for them earlier on, then from the 32K uh, left over from the restructuring, they can pay for it out of pocket outside of it. But then after the like after they cover the credit card debt and the car, uh, the whatever's left in the car, they can shift all that money to caring for John, and any leftovers can go, for instance, to paying for like Andrew or Olivia in their educational journey. Yeah, and I want to make it clear that this is a question of where they allocate their money. There's plenty enough in the priority list, which is why we're not just leaving John to fend for himself. We're actually providing the money necessary for him to have the support he needs. Thank you. May I ask a, a follow-on question? I, in your uh, presentation, I believe you talked about the family has uh, roughly 35000 left over each year when you look at their cash flow. How did you think about that money going to those different buckets between the emergency savings, increasing retirement, and paying for John? Can you maybe just give a little bit more detail on how you, how you thought about them using that 35000 a year? Uh huh. So from the thirty-five thousand, this is specifically from the categories that is provided in the case study. So these are probably the major like expenses and liabilities that they have to pay for, such as their mortgage and um, insurance. And in our priorities list, we present you our list of like what is the most urgent and what is the most important. So this money just starts at the very top and it slowly trickles down when the money is used up and when you cover the like the top priorities like your credit card your car payments then that gets eliminated and you can put more money into the second more second most urgent um priority and then this goes down all the way until they have zero debt and then they will be able to complete their long-term goals like help their children fund their education and then uh, retire comfortably and I want to add that the beauty of this is that a lot of calculations are worst case scenario. So let's say John's wood cutting business goes off, then a lot of his priorities can come in a lot earlier, which means that when we provide the baseline scenario for them, the family can plan from there and make their decisions as a result of the worst case scenario. Thank you. Um, so excellent presentation, and I know you guys have worked really hard at this. So. Thank you. Well done. A uh, quick follow-up question. One of the things that, um, that we talked about was about retirement and that being a critical goal for uh, Steve. Would love to understand how you thought about how much he saves for retirement and maybe what he could do to continue to build that relative to the company match. So what we did first was that we figured out the average like uh, life expectancy in the United States, so 76 years, right? And then Let's assume that Steve retires at 62, or um, Emily retires at 65. So we figured out that there's going to be like a, more than a decade left. That One they, minute remaining. There's going to be more than a decade left, which they need to like sustain themselves. So we picked a more like reasonable estimate of like 13 years, and we figured out that if they're able to survive off their current income, then it would be much better if they can survive 13 more years off their additional like their current income. So we multiplied the income times 13 to figure out what they would need for retirement to live comfortably. And then we realized the pension or the social security with Emily's case might cover like a significant portion of that. And then the retirement accounts investments will help cover the remaining part that's needed. And what we said was that since there's like more than a decade for these investments to grow, for instance, the Roth IRA for Emily, then the amount of money there's gonna be left for retirement will actually be far larger than what we predicted because this is assuming that the Roth IRA doesn't in even increase at all, which is definitely not true. We see like six, five to 6% six returns like annualized, like say for investments. So we can definitely see the growth that can help sustain them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks right. so much. Well, time is up. Once again, let's give a good round of applause to Vestivia Hills from Alabama, Vestavia Hills. And now our second top four team, please welcome to the stage from Arkansas, the Arkansas School for Math, Science, and Technology. We've got Ayana Toombs, Beatrice Nkunga, and Daniel Nkunga. Once again, they will have 10 minutes to present and five minutes for questions. All right, teams, welcome to the final four. You're gonna have 10 minutes to present. At nine minutes, I will give you a one minute warning. And after that, your time will be up. Then the judges will have five minutes to ask questions. 
At four minutes, I will give you a one minute warning, and after that, you will stop. Are you ready? All right, let's give him a round of applause. You may begin now. Um, hello, my name's Ayana Toombs. I'm Beatrice Nkunga. And I'm Daniel Nkunga. And this is our financial plan for the Wallace family. So meet the Wallace family. We have, we decided they were located in Cleveland, Ohio, just because we're here, it's convenient. Mm -hmm. But we have Steve, the electrician, Emily, the paralegal, and then Andrew, who's 18, and he's currently in a gap year, and Olivia, who's a young artist, and John, who we think is the world's number one grandpa. We Okay, so um, when deciding on this plan for the Wallace family, we decided to keep these things in mind. So first of all, comprehensibility. We want to provide digestible financial advice. It's important that they understand what they're doing to better implement it. We wanted to keep in mind flexibility, um, suggesting plans that the family can adapt to. We know that um, things are always changing, especially with growing children. And then we also want stability. Um, so. We want to minimize the amount of risk, first of all, associated with the plan and just setting the Wallace family up for success for their future. As you can see, the time got to us. We can describe <laughs> so. the topic here. But um, for immediate changes, we just kind of wanted to solidify monthly spending. We didn't see a comprehensible budget present. We wanted to address the topic of debt and we also wanted to implement a budget. So first of all, with monthly spending, this is um, the net um, income right here. As you can see, there's housing, transportation, um, savings and debt, et cetera, et cetera. And so right now, what we're left with is a bunch of money, almost $5,000 worth of money that doesn't have like a home yet. So we wanted to, um, first of all, allocate that in a budget because it's important to spend every single penny. That way you know where you're going in the future and where your money is going currently. Okay, and so first of all, credit card debt, very immediate, it's very weighing them down. Um, we wanted to first of all pay and hold the $1,000 credit card debt. And then for the two and three and the 2019 Subaru, over the course of six months to um, distribute the payments, first of all, especially if they're not comfortable spending over $5,000 just paying off debt. This allocates it over the, the time of six months and yeah. Um, that's what we decided to do with that. I also want to re-highlight on the flexibility here. All these are debt payments that we think are important, right? But also they can be put off a bit further on if you're not comfortable paying them all now. So if you don't want to pay off $1,000 right here, right now, as we suggest, you can pay them off in the course of two or three years and we're still fine with our plan. So some of the long-term solutions that we thought were pressing for this family were retirement plans, consistent savings, external investment, and just, again, budget ex execution. So in Andrew's future, we decided that the best uh, um, idea for him would be community college, since he sort of doesn't really have a set plan, but we think it just gives him uh, a cheaper option for a great career, or a great foundation for a career. Mm -hmm. So we decided a good, Potential major for him would be like business management or even sociology, just because he enjoys that volunteer work already. And with this work study program that they offer, he could be at making around three thousand dollars per month to be able to pay up, pay off that tuition and fees, which ends up being around two thousand. But um, with housing and living, this ends up being around seven thousand dollars per month. We think um, with the parents providing for at least the first six months, but if even farther if they feel necessary. Um, he can have that first you know, foundation, since he's already older and doesn't really have time to create um, money out of nowhere, um, just to you know, get his, his career and future started. Mm -hmm. For Olivia's future, she already has a passion, kind of knows where she wants to go. So we think that it's important to nurture that passion that she already has and set her on that path. It is a pricier school, um, the Chicago Institute of Art, but we think with, um, uh, maybe loans taken from the equity and uh, the work study that they also offer that she can achieve these goals. Uh, also with the trust fund that she already has. We recommend that the parents pay not the full 100%, but rather 80% or maybe even less than that. Again, it just shows that flexibility that they have in paying and also just allows her to work, um, work on her own independence and financial um, knowledge. One of the major issues we want to cover was retirement plans as well, as it's a big goal for Steve, who currently invests only 3% in his retirement and has only 210000 saved up. 
and he wants to retire by the age of 62 with some hobbies and minds already. So we suggest that he increases um, um, retirement inve invest, um, investments to 5%, which his company will match to give him 10% of his but, um, month yearly income re into retirement. And we also want to highlight that his family was covered in these expenses because even after John passes, which he's going to increase that something to $500 like he wanted to, we can change that money's location from going to John to going to help his children because, again, they're an important part of his life. So we don't want to just count them off once he gets retired and the income slows down a little bit. Furthermore, we already, we already accounted for the bills of cowards and house maintenance because we, he wants to take money from Social Security, and we figured out we can take half of that just to go cover the, car, the cost of maintaining a house and car and the bills and stuff, such like that so that we have a bit more money to go into other amenities. And we also want to advise him to live a more cheaper lifestyle, or apparently that cheaper lifestyle when he retires. Just because he wants to do woodworking and other stuff like that, we want to make sure he has money to go around. For Emily, she also, she also wants to, we also need to retire soon. We have her estimated for her to retire at 65, though she doesn't have a concrete plan left. And she's a lot less safe than Steve, but that's still not an issue for us. We, again, suggest that she, she start investing more consistently, because she currently only invests periodically now. We want to say she should invest 5% towards her retirement, because again, it's a per persistent issue that we can't just push off until later. And furthermore, we suggest he starts paying, saving at least 3% now towards other investment in the future. Like we suggest a stockbroker just so they can invest further into the future without her having to constantly maintain her income. Okay, lastly, we have investments and savings. So um, prior to our advice, there were three major um, savings group, Andrew's 529 plan for college, um, the couple's joint savings account, and Olivia's trust. So here to furthermore allocate all of the money so they know where all of it's going, all of their income is going, we allocated, um, yes, as you can see on the screen, 1,500 to Andrews, 1,200 to the joint savings, et cetera. And so we also created an emergency fund because um, as we know, families, things come up, a washer gets broken, um, car breaks down. So having an emergency fund to supplement the joint savings account um, was important to us. Okay, so lastly, as you can see, um, our first little chart there that we had in the beginning, it had maybe about $5,000 left at the end. Here we have zero. We allocated every single thing, every single um, cent, I mean. And yeah, this is just our goal for the um, Wallace family. The, so they have some concrete budgeting in place to um, meet their goals and their future goals. Once again, I want to highlight the comprehensibility. I think it's a pretty simple plan to follow. And also, it's very flexible for them. I know the big zero at the bottom might be good to us, because we're allocating all our money. But it might be scary to a family who's like, I don't know where I'm going to get money to do random things now. And so it's very flexible, because you can have a bit more to spend for yourself without ruining the plan. OK, so overall, um, we just kept in mind, of course, our feasibility, comprehensibility. Um, and flexibility. We want to emphasize that we we invest in what we have. So sometimes building up on what we um, on what we do not have, I guess, is a bit unfeasible. So just working with what we've got and solidifying the foundations that you have for your family financially um, is important. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm going to ask for the clock to be reset. Now the judges will have follow-up questions for you. We'll have five minutes, and I'll give you a one-minute warning when four minutes have passed. We may start now. Great. Well, great job. Uh, you guys clearly put a lot of time into it, and we loved your visuals, so well done. Um, I would just ask you to maybe elaborate a little bit more about how they can save for retirement. I saw the piece about maximizing the company match. So if you can talk us through a little bit more of how you're thinking about their retirement savings. Well, um, we figured out their current retirement plans wouldn't last them that long. Like Steve's only last him about, with his current funds, eight and a quarter years. And so we want to maximize the company match just to help him go a little bit further. And for Steve, we also, I also focus on making sure that he covers all the costs of living. So Emily, we can invest more in the future retirement. So she's not just covering costs. She's not covering cost of living. She's costing, covering the cost of living like in terms of investing in other places and funding other activities. 
Also with Emily, we took into account that she enjoys her job. Like it said that specifically in the thing. So we decided that she could work a few more years. Like we gave her 65, but again, with that flexibility, she can work until she's a bit older if she feels like it's necessary. And again, just accrue more money to, to count, cover for all those costs. Uh, I'll say first, really well done. So excellent job. Um, you you uh, outlined the extra cash that that they have on the table and and how they should use that. Can you just give us a little bit more of your rationale between how much they should put in five twenty nine versus emergency savings? So just thinking about that uh, that extra monthly uh, dollars they had available. Of Thanks. So. Um, we kind of just went with the um, outline that we already had, so immediate versus um, long-term goals. Uh, so immediately, Andrew needs money for college, and so the 529 plan got a big chunk of money for Andrew. And then second of all, um, what's her name? Olivia, I'm sorry. <laughs> Olivia um, also needs to go to college, an expensive college, so we calculated how much maybe she would need to match 80% um, for her parents to match 80% of her tuition, and so that was like a computer number. And then second of all, um, emergency fund, very important, very important. So we just kind of split it in between the two, the joint savings and the, um, the emergency fund. We also took um, the refund that they get from to, to get that 1500 number for both of them, so I guess the money isn't coming from anywhere, it's, it's from the, the tax yeah tax refunds. Thank you. So um, let, let's back up um, just a little bit. Uh, so is, is Steve retiring at 62 or, or no? I, I know he wants to. What are, what are you telling him? Currently we still have him set up to retire at 62 because that seemed to be a heavy focus of his. Though it's not the most feasible plan for him, we still allow him to do so if he really does want to. Again, we plan for Emily to work a bit longer to like 65, maybe 70, and maybe boost Steve up to 65 as well, but we want them to be able to retire as soon as they feel ready to. Okay, and, and so the, the numbers then that flowed through your presentation, that's him at 62? Yes, ma'am. Got it, okay. And so part of the case was they're talking about, um, you know, do we, do we tap into our home equity? for our kids' um, education? Do we pay off our mortgage early? What, what do you say to them what, as clients when they come to you with that kind of so, problem? Yeah, so um, we recognize that the, what are they, the Wallaces, I'm sorry. Then we recognize that the Wallaces are a normal family. They're very standard, they're doing well. And so- One minute left. So they're, um, their home buying or their home buying the way they're financially set up right now it's very standard they're doing fine um, the their it's budgeted in great I mean yeah yeah, yeah. and so um, yeah please <laughs> no you're good so yeah what she was saying they have a great foundation they they know where they're going we just kind of offered more guidance so I think what we would tell them or like reassure them is that they're not doing anything crazy it's just we they need to I guess make more sacrifices like for example they use that 3,000 typically um, for the tax refund for like a family vacation instead of a family vacation maybe we can give that to the kids or you know co co cover more of those costs that they were worried about like the mortgage maybe but uh, where they are right now is not um, I guess untypical for a family here and they're doing fine Thank you. Yeah. All right, round of applause, and that is time. <laughs> Big congratulations to the Arkansas School for Mathematics, Science, and the Arts, Iana Toombs, Beatrice and Kunga, and Daniel and Kunga. One more time for them, everybody. And now we welcome to the stage our third top four team, all the way from California. Adrian Wilcox High School with Manish Mothi, Joshua Ching, Diane Shea, and Chloe Michelle. Come on up, guys. You're next. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final four. You have 10 minutes to present. At nine minutes, I will give you a one-minute warning. At 10 minutes, I will ask you to, to stop. After that, the judges will have five minutes to ask you follow-up questions where I will give you a one-minute warning. Okay, with that being said, round of applause for our team. 
and you may begin. Hello, Judge. Can we reset the clock, please? Just do a tech check really quick with the microphone. Hello? Hello? Okay, here we go. So, you may begin. Cool. Hello, judges. We are all financial advisors here from Cash Money Financial Consulting. My name is Joshua Ching. My name is Manish Moti. My name is Diane Shi. And my name is Chloe Michelle. Today, we're going to be advising the Wallace family in regards to their financial situation. For the purpose of this, we are estimating, we're assuming that they live in the state of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so now let's meet the Wallace family. Steve is 47. He's a master electrician making $80,000 a year. Emily, his wife, is 46. She's a paralegal making $64,000 a year. John, Steve's father, is 80 and is currently living in an assisted health facility. They have one son named Andrew who is currently 18 and a niece named Olivia. This is the five-step financial advising process that Cash Money follows for all of our financial um, people. So this is what we'll be using for the Wallace family today. First, let's identify the Wallace family's goals. They have four main goals, which are to plan for retirement, plan for Andrew and Olivia's education, pay off their debts, and plan for future living expenses and family members. All right, let's take a look at the Wallace's family's current financial situation. All right, so monthly income. Every month, the Wallace family is bringing in around $12,000, and after taxes and employer-sponsored deductions are taken out, they have a total net take-home pay of $8,176. These are what typical monthly expenses look like for the Wallace family. Currently, they're spending the most on housing costed, costs, the assisted living for the Grandpa John, and their living expenses. After subtracting their expenses from their net income, they have $2,793 left in disposable income that we are going to advise them how to use so they can best set up for their financial future. So here are some of our strategic recommendations for the Wallace family. We decided to split up our plan into phases because we know that it's unrealistic to get everything done at once. So phase one is from zero to 12 years. All right, now for their tax refund, we know that they typically spend their tax refund on their vacation savings. However, we want to dedicate this towards paying off their high APR debts. And so paying off their credit card debts, they have around $500 remaining, which they can easily pay off in a year. Now, when they are paying off their debts, they're going to be building up their credit score, which means that they're going to be uh, being able to get higher uh, or better rates on their loans in the future or if they want to refinance. And also, we want to start a credit card for Andrew to build his credit score early on. And when it comes to savings, having an emergency savings account equal to at least six months of expenses is crucial. And that's around $30,000 for the Wallace family. Through our five-year plan, if they save $325 per month into a high-yield savings account, they'll be able to do so. Now, as Manish mentioned, they are using that tax that they typically use for the annual family vacations, uh, and they're putting it into paying off debts. So we have also put aside a goal of around $250 per month into also a high-yield savings account so that they have that income that they can use to go on vacation this next year. All right, children's education. This is super important to the Wallace family and we definitely took that into account. Andrew, who doesn't necessarily know what he wants to do yet, uh, is someone who we would recommend go to regional Ohio State University campus for around $9,000 alone uh, per year for the tuition. And he will live at home so that he doesn't have to pay room and board. Um, and by doing this, he can contribute $725 per month into just the Ohio 529 state education plan. Now, the main reason why we're recommending this path for Andrew to begin with is because Ohio State University has a very special program called the University Exploration Program. Now, this has peer advisors, academic advisors, and specific programs for those like Andrew to explore the over 200 majors available at Ohio State University. So not only is he able to kind of explore what he wants to do, but they're able to do so in a very cost-effective way. Also, of course, we want Andrew to apply to FAFSA, scholarship and grants, in order to help them with financial aid. Now, when it comes to Olivia, she does have this goal to go to the Chicago Art Institute. However, we do not think it is realistic to pin that as her dream and really start saving all that money for something that she wants to do, but she's very young right now. So our plan for her is planning around the average art school tuition, which rounds out to the average Ohio in-state public college tuition as well. So if they contribute around $795 per month. Now, we don't want to kind of 
kill her dream of going to art school, so we do definitely recommend that she enter art contests and community art programs in order to not just gauge at her passion, but also see where she lies um, in her ability to be an artist. And of course, most importantly, we want her to apply to FAFSA, but more specifically, scholarships that cater towards her specific story. Olivia's parents unfortunately passed away, and this is something that a lot of programs and scholarships look for when giving out financial aid. So she should definitely apply to that and use her story as a backdrop. All right, let's take a look at John's assisted living. So we plan for the Wallace family to increase the payment for John's assisted living to $500 a month as he's 80 years old and he's probably gonna have, he may have more health complications in the future. Um, if Steve's health insurance plan is a high deductible plan, we want him to create an HSA for John if possible, which will allow um, him to have long-term care insurance and because the HSA is triple tax advantage, which we can explain later. When it comes to insurances, we have five main types of insurances that we're recommending. The first one being health. Josh explained what we were recommending in phase one. And in phase three, when the family is off Steve's employer health insurance plan, we recommend that they buy a high deductible health plan through for her family and open up an HSA through that. Now for car insurance, during phase three, we'll talk about this later, but they are going to get a new truck and sell their old one. So we just want them to be mindful to account for the changes in insurance. Now when it comes to life insurance, we recommend that starting in phase one, they purchase first to die 10 year term life insurance with coverage of at least $750,000. And this will be around $50 per month. Now the main reason why we're, rec we're recommending life insurance is because they do have dependents. So in the case that either one of them passes away, this will help cover cover all of their assets. Now, starting in phase two and phase two only, they will have both disability and long-term care insurance. Uh, this will help make sure that Steve, who already has some health complications during phase one, um, it'll help make sure that all of his health care is taken care of, and in the case that something does happen to him, uh, they will be financially secure. All right, and moving over to the mortgage, we want to continue paying off their $164,000 debt over the next 12 years. We're suggesting that they don't take an expedited method, and we'll explain later on. And so paying over the next 12 years, they'll be able to retire debt-free from uh, not owing any debt for their mortgage. And we also suggest to never take out home equity, whether it be through a home equity line of credit or a home uh, loan. It is bad and unnecessary debt. And it's also, uh, if you default on that loan, you basically lose your house. All right, let's take a look at phase two, which is from years 12 to 18. All right, so for transportation, we recommend that the Wallace family keep on paying off Emily's Subaru Forester as they only have around $4,300 left on that loan. We know that Steve wants a new truck, and to do that, to buy that, we recommend that he sell his current truck, his Ford F-150, for eight to $10,000 and use that money as a down payment on a new car, which we, which we recommend is a Toyota Tacoma uh, for $28,000. We recommend this truck because it has, it's more reliable than his old F-150 and has better gas mileage and also still can carry all the work equipment he needs as an electrician. Right, and Steve is going to retire in phase three, and we want to make sure that he has a happy retirement. One of his goals is to have a woodworking shop, and so if he saves $100 per month into a high-yield savings account, he can achieve this throughout all of phase two. Now, for retirement, we suggest that they both retire at the age of 65. This is to maximize their Medicare, uh, because it starts at 65, and also to get full benefits on their Social Security. Now for his 401k, we suggest in phase one to up his contribution limit to match his employer match. And in phase two to then when his income increases to get uh, the max contribution limit as well as catch up contributions. Now for Emily, we suggest that since her payment method is sporadic, we suggest maxing out and being, having consistent payments. Also, we suggest to open up a Roth IRA um, because it is uh, tax free and paired with the uh, tax deferred uh, 401k, it allows for a sort of tax hedge. And also we suggest to invest in target date index funds because they have low expense ratios, they have automatic asset rebalancing features, and they are diversified. So phase three, One which, minute is, left. which is years 18 and beyond. So in phase three, that we recommend um, that the Wallace family establish an irrevocable living trust to avoid probate taxes and to make sure that their assets get divided the way they want them to be. Now that we have found outlined effective strategies, here's how we will implement them. These are the major changes that we made to the monthly spending plan, saving more on spending more on retirement savings, credit, uh, paying off the credit cards, starting an emergency savings, and increasing all insurances and paying for the children's 529 plan. 
We expect them to keep the same uh, income, so we want them to be on a zero-based budget, so all the money that they have is allocated to a specific resource. And that two million you see at the end is how much they're gonna have um, accumulated from their retirement accounts, their assets, the pension, uh, et cetera. So step five, review progress. Every six months, we're gonna check back in with the Wallace family to make sure that they can keep their budget and to see if we need to make any um, adjustments. Thank you, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> with that being said, that is time. Please reset the clock at five minutes. And now, judges will ask you some follow-up questions. At four minutes, I will give you one minute uh, heads up. So with that being said, we may begin. Thank you, really well done, excellent job. Um, my question uh, is- Excuse me, I'm sorry, please reset the clock to five minutes, there we go. You may begin. Okay, thank you. My question is around uh, into retirement, um, where the case study talks about that Steve's health care will only cover himself into retirement and not the rest. How did you all think about uh, the, the cost of health care in retirement? Yeah, absolutely. So Josh, if you go back to the insurances slide, in phase three, we have set up, asked them to purchase a high deductible health plan in which they can set up for an HSA as well. So not only is the high deductible health plan going to cover the family, um, excluding Steve, since he has his employer uh, match still, um, but this will also set up an HSA. So if Steve or any other family members for that matter have t uh, specific uh, health causes that they need to extract from. This is a really, really great tool, as it's, as Josh mentioned, triple tax advantage. And it also accounts for that long-term care insurance in there so that you know they're set up for the future. OK. Well, great job. It was wonderful to hear from you guys. And it's thank very you. obvious that you spent a lot of time thinking about this. So thank you. Um, I want to drill a little bit deeper into um, their health uh, insurance and also how you think about retirement savings. I saw you had the note there about increasing the match so that he could get the full match, but would love for you to drill down into how you also thought about Emily and where you see their retirement. I think you had the two million number, maybe a little bit more around your math on that, please. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we can dive into the retirement first. So uh, I could talk about, I could talk about Steve. Uh, can you go to Steve's um, slide? So yeah, so we wanted to contribute, first of all, um, in phase one, they didn't really have uh, that flexible of a spending plan. So we wanted to uh, still plan for retirement, but to kind of maximize our gain. And since the match is basically free money, we wanted to contribute at least to the max. I think it's important to at least contribute to the max for any retirement plan possible. And for our overall assets, uh, if you go back, if you go to the asset slide, yeah, so, um, from the uh, Roth IRA, the uh, Emily's 401k, and then um, I guess Steve's 401k as well, uh, these all equate to about $1.6 million over the span of um, 18 years. And also, uh, Steve has his pension, which he will go off of, uh, his home, uh, which is he has equity in, full equity. And also, in general, they do have uh, a sort of HSA, right, at this point. So this is kind of a, an emergency health account. Oh, and going off of that a little bit, um, in terms of Emily's, uh, I guess, health care, we have set them up on, if you go back to the insurances, we do have long-term care, and uh, that's into the HSA. So we will account for her health insurance through that. Uh, that was a that was, uh, very good job. Very good job. Um, what if Steve doesn't want a Toyota? <laughs> All right. All right. Um, we just chose um, the Toyota Tacoma as like a recommendation for him. Of course, there are plenty of great options for trucks. There's like the Chevy Silverado. There's the there's like the Ram 1500. Uh, we just chose this one because it's the most fuel efficient and the most reliable of the bunch. Also, I have one I have one of these at home, so I'm kind of biased, but that's how it is. These are all merely recommendations. He does not have to get that specific truck. Yeah, there, there it is. <laughs> okay, so my serious question is, um, talk to us a little bit about how you prioritize the, the buckets when funds are freed up. So when funds are freed up from paying off credit cards or from paying off vehicles or when funds are freed up, when John no longer needs, One minute <laughs> needs left. care, talk to us about how you decided is the bucket retirement, kids, 
tell us how you, how you made those choices. Yeah, absolutely. So this is kind of the main reasons why we have specific phases. Now, phase one is the main bucket, I, I guess, would be children's education. Um, that's why we made it 12 years as well, because by the end of 12 years, Olivia will have graduated college. So that'll be the main push for uh, phase one. And Manish can talk more about it. Yeah, and additionally in phase one, they're going to be paying off their uh, home mortgage in full. So that's another debt that they're getting rid of. And also they're going to get rid of their credit card debt, but this is going to be very early on. And then um, in phase two, well, in phase one, we're still contributing to the retirement. However, in phase two, once they have that, you know, increased income or uh, so they have more income, right, uh, they can prioritize more of the retirement, invest more heavily. And this is also where they can take advantage of the catch-up. Time is up. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well done from California, Adrian Wilcox High School. Once again, give it up for Manish Mothi, Joshua Ching, Diane Shea, and Chloe Michelle. And now, last but not least, our final uh, team of the final four from Kansas. Please welcome to the stage Grayson Anderson, Zach Cocky, and Bradley Harris of Andover High School. All right. Hello, welcome to the final four. You're gonna have 10 minutes for your presentation. At nine minutes, I will give you a one minute warning. Then after that, I will ask you all to stop. Following that, you'll have five minutes for Q&A and I will give you a one minute warning when four minutes are up. With that being said, are you ready? Yes, sir. Round of applause, please. You may begin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brad Harris and these are my colleagues, Zach Cocky and Grayson Anderson, and we are BGZ Financial. So right now we're gonna meet the family. This is the Wallace family. We got Steve, he's 47 years old, makes $80,000 a year, has generous benefits through his um, employer and plans on retiring at age 62. He's married to Emily, she's 46 years old, makes $64,000 a year, but her employer does not match her 401k. They have one child, his name is Andrew, he's 18 years old. He's exploring post-secondary options, but right now he's taking a gap year. Their niece, Olivia, unfortunately her parents have passed away. So Steve and Emily are in charge of her. She is 10, and with that, they have gotten $10,000 in a trust and from the parents that they would like to go towards her education, and she wants to go to the Chicago Institute, or Chicago Art Institute. So, in addition, there's also this guy named John. He's eight years old, and he's Steve's father. He's currently living in independent living, but hopefully he can move up to assisted living soon. Okay, uh, BGZ's four steps to success. Uh, first, we're gonna assess our goals, develop a plan based on those goals, and take our course of action, and then monitor our success with the clients. So our goals, Steve hopes to retire by the age of 62. Uh, he wants to pay off his mortgage so he can own his home outright before then. Uh, Andrew's future, he wants to be taken care of financially. Uh, he wants to contribute to his father's step-up care. And he wants to supplement Olivia's trust fund money uh, to provide for her uh, attendance to Chicago's Art Institute. So for our plans, um, for Steve and Emily, we definitely want to max out his 401k employer match. He's missing out on that by 2%. The employer will match 5% of his um, contributions, so we want to max that out. And we might consider selling the house for them since their kids will be moving out of the house soon. For Andrew, we need him to explore some post-secondary options, probably like a local in-state community college and also begin a part-time job to raise some or earn some money for post-secondary options. For John, he's gonna remain in independent living until the car, their car is paid off, and that monthly payment will then be moved to his assisted living. For Olivia, we're gonna open a 529 plan and contribute very aggressively since she is still pretty young, and we'll consider local college options that are more budget-friendly. 
So, so looking at their debt, they have three kinds of debt. They have home debt, credit card debt, and car debt. Their home debt, they pay $2,022 a month on P&I, insurance, and taxes. Um, on top of that, with their 5.5% um, 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Their credit card debt, they have credit cards. Two, Emily has two credit cards, and uh, Steve has one. And together, they combine for an average balance of $3,500. And their car debt isn't too bad. Steve's car is completely paid off, which is very good for Steve. And uh, Emily's car is only only has $4,370 left until it's paid off, which is very good for her since it's a 2019 car. Looking at their assets and liabilities, their total combined income is $144,000 with the $3,000 tax refund that they get. Their taxes, because they're married and file, filing jointly, uh, they're in the tax bracket where they pay $22,914 in taxes. You can see their car insurance, the 40K1 match, the 3% that they add every year, home payment, this is all yearly, credit cards combined, and John support yearly. We adjusted for the uh, assisted living care where it's $500 a month because he'll definitely need that soon. So their disposable yearly income comes out to be $82,042, and that comes out to be $6,836 a month. All right, so for our insurance, uh, their life insurance is pretty inadequate when it comes to life insurance payouts for both Steve and Emily. Uh, they're receiving close to one and a half times their yearly salary when most of the time you should be looking from anywhere to eight to time eight to ten times your salary for that life insurance payout uh, we also want them to consider a, a whole life and term uh, insurance something like long long-term disability insurance uh, home and auto we want them to try to combine their home and auto insurance for better rates and for auto insurance their rates are pretty adequate depending on uh, what type of co what type of coverage they have on each of their vehicles? Uh, for health, they want to keep Steve's uh, health insurance post retirement and opt in for the family health insurance option because uh, after retirement it would become individual insurance. But we want him to keep that insurance and keep it for his family. So here's our solution with the house. They want to own it quicker. They want to get rid of their 30-year uh, fixed mortgage. So we want to refinance it to a 10-year fixed rate loan. This lowers the interest rates, but also makes their monthly payments more affordable for them and more cost adjustable. Um, in this case, the house gets paid off in 10 years rather than 12. So they're saving two years, and they own it t two years earlier. With the car, we want to pay off Emily's car as soon as possible and make month, pr preferably make monthly contributions. Um, and we suggest that they keep these cars until the kids go to college. So you're looking at about eight years to keep these cars. Um, and that's because uh, if you were to buy a car, the money you'd put towards a car, now you can put in their 529 counts, accounts and pay for their college. And for the credit card, we actually recommend them switching Steve's credit card to a college counts 529 rewards visa card because this gives you 1.529% cash back. And that money goes directly into the 529 accounts you have set up for your kids, helping them pay for their kids' college because Andrew specifically needs it, and so does Olivia. So assessing individual goals, we have Steve. So he wants to take woodworking. He wants to become like a woodworker and... Um, uh, he wants to take woodworking. So we suggest that right now he starts taking classes to eliminate the startup costs because that costs about $8,000. So if he were to eliminate that, he can put money towards co kids' college and other things more necessary right now and wait until he's financially stable enough to get startup on his own. For the kids, we want them to look into scholarships, FAFSA, and grants for Andrew because he's going off to college here in a couple months after his gap year. And we want to help him find a good job because he's unemployed and he's 18. He should probably start getting a job and start getting out in the real world. We want to help Olivia look into other schools, poss possibly community college for two years before the CAI. So our investment strategies, strategies for Steve, we're going to match his, max out his 401k, so his employer will match 5% of that contribution. We're also going to open a Roth IRA and co contribute monthly to that as well. In addition to those, we're going to also start an emergency fund with a balance of a minimum of six months expenses in it just in case anything goes wrong. For Emily, we're going to start funding a Roth IRA as well since her um, 401k isn't matched by her employer. And we also might consider finding a job that has a 401k match because that's something we should definitely take advantage of. For the children and well, Olivia too, um, we're going to use the income from his new job to fund um, post-secondary options. And for Olivia, we're going to 
fund the 529 plan aggressively with $10,000 from the trust. We're also going to apply for scholarships and grants to lighten the load. Some additional financial suggestions for this family that most people don't realize um, that can cut back on yearly costs is one of them is subscriptions. Most people don't realize that ma the average American family spends over $1,000 on subscriptions yearly. Um, that's more than most people would ever think. Also on food, most families spend $5,000 to $8,000 yearly on food. Like going out can really be expensive. So we would suggest like cooking food like at their house, going to the grocery store instead. And for TV, that's another big one. People pay a lot for cable and other services like that. We recommend switching to like a streaming service, which is usually cheaper. One minute left. All right, so year one, we want them to check in quarterly with us uh, so that we can just ensure that their investments are going accordingly and that they're keeping to their plan because it seems like they had a little trouble uh, with their first child investing in that 529. Uh, year two through five, we want them to check in semi-annually with us just so we can make sure once again that they're investing at the, the times that they need to be and providing as much as they should for Olivia's College or anything like that. Uh, year five, we want them to reassess our, uh, their goals and rethink their financial trajectory based on how well they've been contributing so far, whether that be more or less. So yeah, with that, with our plan in mind, we estimate that the Wallace family will be able to retire comfortably and be able to send their college kids send their kids to college. Thank you. All right, time is up. Reset the clock, please. You have five minutes for Q and A. I will give you one minute warning. Are you ready? Let's begin. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'd like a little peek behind the curtain um, when you were talking about what to prioritize. Um, different expenses are gonna start rolling off, right? They pay off the credit card, they pay off a truck. Um, John will no longer need support at some point. So how did you discuss, what, was your, what were your priority buckets when those income streams started to materialize? in terms of going to retirement, mm -hmm. going to kids' education? How did you decide what rose to the top? So we looked at their goals, and we decided, we looked at where is their biggest weakness right now. And we specifically, what caught our eye was the colleges, the kids' college accounts. I mean, Olivia, I know she's 10, but they only have a little bit saved up for her. And Andrew, he just took a gap year, a volunteer year. He didn't make any money, so we suggest he actually, we need to, like, we looked at that, and like, he's going to college next year. They're going to have to pay for this somehow. So we decided that that was our biggest, like that was the biggest priority right now, and that's where we want to focus our attention. We know Steve wants to retire at 62, and we're thinking about it, and we want him to be able to retire at 62, of course. Um, so we decided to put as much money, like pay off whatever debt they have, and which is why we talked about maybe even selling the house, getting a bit of a smaller house after Andrew leaves, because he's gone here in a couple months, because he's 18. Um, so put sell the house possibly, and then that money can help for retirement. But right now, we want to focus all on the co kids' college accounts because that can get really expensive, especially with Olivia wanting to go to the Chicago Art Institute at $53,000 a year. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, great job. R really well done. Um, so I'll ask a, a follow-on question to that. Can you talk about, you mentioned that um, the family had about 80, 82000 of disposable income a year. How did you think about their annual expenditures and what to do with any surplus from that annual budget uh, that you calculated? So yeah, with that um, extra money, we're gonna, I mean, obviously with the children, but also probably like from the Roth, it's a big thing. And the retirement's a big thing that we could work on, especially 62, that's a pretty lofty goal. Um, Zach, you want to add to that? Uh, so basically when it comes to finances, time can be our greatest ally or worst enemy. So I think that it's really important that even though he wants to retire within like 15 years of this time, uh, it's really important to start putting his money towards his retirement plan so that compound interest can add up and hopefully he can retire by the age of 62. Uh, obviously he'll have to reassess as time goes on to see how much he has and how much he's been able to contribute. But um, yeah, it's... 
Well, excellent job and very clear that you guys worked on it and, and good presentation. Question about retirement. So we'll just drill in a, a bit deeper into the retirement piece. It was good to see the note about the match and making sure they maximize the match. And also, Emily, you know, how would you help them think about, you know, short term relative to some of the other things you talked about, which was paying off the mortgage, really building those retirement funds? Um, yeah, so uh, like you said, paying off the mortgage, the retirement was obviously a very big goal. Um, this is why we wanted them to like come back to us like semi-annually through the next five years come so we can reassess their goals, see where they are. But like that's why we said like possibly selling the house after Andrew leaves could be very beneficial to them because if they can downsize a little bit, because obviously they won't need as big of a house with, that, with Andrew gone, if they could downsize a little bit. Um, they could use that money to help definitely go towards retirement, like Grayson said, put into a Roth IRA. One you, minute left. And you can get out uh, post-tax. So it goes in pre-tax, you get it out, and it's no tax. Um, so stuff like that. I mean, different things we can do throughout the future for them um, and help them retire. Both of them retire once, once Emily figures out a time to retire. I'd also like to add, kind of with that extra sum right now, we would say like also invest. That's not really something that was mentioned in the packet or anything, but that's also another thing that could help with that extra sum of money. If we could put that in the stock market and you name it, it's always a good idea. So yeah. All right, thank you very much. Round of applause, please. Thank you to all the teams. The judges will now have time to deliberate and they will come up with a unanimous decision on the winner. Thank you, everyone. So everybody stand by. It'll be a few minutes for deliberation and then we're gonna find the rankings. Once again, one more time for BGZ Financial, Bradley Harris, Grayson Anderson, Zach Kaki from Kansas Andover High School. And, and one more round of applause to all these teams. It's an incredible feat to come here all the way to Cleveland. What an incredible achievement to all of you. Congratulations. We'll be back in just a few minutes.
So I'd like to ask everybody to take their seats and grab whatever they need to grab, another diet, Dr. Pepper, or Pepsi, or whatever we're drinking here today. Do we have all the judges back now? All the other appropriate people, teachers and students? Terrific. So I'm going to invite, uh, so first of all, I just want to say a final congratulations to all of the students and their teachers who participated today. So thank you again. Uh, I'd also like to, yeah, we can do a round of applause. Oh, there they are. And I'd like to invite up Heather Lavalley, the CEO of Voya Financial, and also introduce Angela Harrell, the senior, senior Vice President, Chief Diversity and Corporate Responsibility Offer, Officer. It's a lot of words, and she does a lot of stuff, so that's, that's fine. Um, Angela is the person we'd, we'd met a little bit, we chatted, and when she picked up the phone one day and she said, you know, Nan, I think it's time to talk. We need to do something significant and the rest is history, because I, we, real, we literally would not be here without them today. So um, we're gonna have a few words from Heather after we do the award, so I just wanted to say a few words about her. So in her role, other than being here as a judge and also serving on our board of directors at CEE, Heather helps Americans to become well-planned, well-invested, and well-protected. In other words, she did what you guys did today, but for everyone. So um, we are very thankful for her. And you know, with Heather, and really everybody at Voya, she never really just says the right thing. She's engaged in it and delivered on it, which is so true. Not only is she here, but this huge tens and tens and dozens of dozens of volunteers from across Voya that came today. She is the real McCoy in corporate leadership. I am so proud to know her and have her on our board and have her here with us today to present the awards. Thank you, Nan. Well, I, I've got to tell you, I have been so incredibly impressed with our students today. So just for all of you who are here, every one of you are a winner. Thank you to the students and thank you to all of your coaches and teachers. Really an amazing job. Now, I'll tell you, at, at Voya, as Nan said, this is what we do every day. We kind of call ourselves, we're a little bit of corporate geeks around financial planning. We wake up every single day, and I've got a whole team of folks here in Orange who all we think about is how are we doing our very best to help people plan for a secure financial future, make sure that they've got the right insurance, make sure that they're planned for the unexpected. And so that's why it was so incredibly empowering to see our youth today, our talented teams present with such articulation. And this is coming from somebody who, while I am a CEO of a Fortune uh, 500 company, when I graduated college, I graduated with $3,000 of credit card debt, uh, which I thought seemed to be a good idea. And I didn't really know much about uh, credit cards and interest. And my grandmother used to say, is that a hole in your pocket or is that just the money burning through it? So to have all of you have this incredible poise and thought this is about empowerment. So today what we got to see is collaboration in action. We got to see empowerment in action. And every single one of you, as they say, are gonna walk away a winner because you have learned lifelong skills that you'll carry with you wherever you go. So with that, I have the privilege of announcing our winners. I'm gonna jump right in. So let me start with our fourth place winner of the National Personal Finance Challenge. I'd like to congratulate and welcome the Andover team from Kansas to the stage. Some mothers. 
All right. Our third place winners are from the Arkansas School of Math, Science, and Technology. Come on up to the stage and congratulations. All right, I, get my, I don't have my reading glasses here, so I'm going to take my pause for a second. Now, our second place winner is from Vestavia Hills, Alabama. Congratulations. <laughs> And finally, to our first place winners that I'm going to hire to help with our, my financial plan, uh, I'd like to congratulate Adrian Wilcox from California, our first place winners of the National Personal Finance Challenge. So before I turn it back, oh, we'll, uh, we'll let the team start. No, you're good. Before, uh, before I turn it back over to Nan, 
know, we talked about all of the amazing students who are here, um, thanking all of the, te the, the teachers and the chaperones and parents um, who helped each of you to get here. Um, I also want to take a moment and thank CEE, because without the tireless passion and energy from this organization to make this its life, its life work, to really help and ensure personal finances is embedded into our education. You know, to me, this is something that is at the cornerstone of what our country needs, and it is helping to empower the youth who all of you who will one day be ruling our country. Um, so with that, just a huge thank you to NAN and the CE organization. And uh, at this point, I'll turn it back over to NAN. I have a few more thank yous. I'm also always the shortest person and can never reach the mic. Uh, so of course, uh, Voya, we really wouldn't be here without them. I wanted to do some special call outs to Braden, Marish, and Don Templin. Um, Braden's been the master, master person behind all of the things that, that, that happen when Heather and, and Angela say, yeah, it's a really good idea. And then Braden works with us to make it happen. Special thanks to Kaz. At the Cleveland, Cleveland Fed, we've been working on this for since before the pandemic. We finally made it. Everybody at the Federal Reserve, it's always a pleasure to come to any of the Fed locations, but Cleveland has been super special the last few days. The Barker Center for Economic Education helped so much, and of course, my own team, because it's really not me. It's Rosanna Castillo, Hannah Eckstein, Melissa Higgins, and a whole bunch of other people. Half of my staff is here today. Um, and also our wonderful and patient videographer, John Palacio, and the And Now team uh, for being here. And with that, I am closing off the 2023 National Personal Finance Challenge. And I am looking forward to seeing a good number of you next year in 2024. So thanks, everyone. Have a great trip home. And again, congratulations. Thank you.